Namaste. So, taking a little break after that long <laughs> third Pada episode, I got two questions, very good questions, from one of our intelligent viewers. And I thought to answer them in a video because they're really good and they probably apply to many of our viewers. So here they are. Is there any kind of ego resistance when a person embarks on the quest for self-realization? For my part, I sometimes have the impression that the more I walk on the trails, the more my ego resists me and gives rise to bad feelings in me, a sort of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. A sort of little voice that tells me, what's the point? All this is nonsense. <laughs> well, this is the Western ego. We are conditioned to be skeptics, to reject any truth that threatens the domination of the ego. Why? Because if our ego is solid and strong, it can be manipulated. This is one of the great truths. If you know what someone is identified with, then you can manipulate them by manipulating their identifications. For example, the body, or money, or family, or so many things. So the people in power craft an educational system that denies everything spiritual, and even most things mental, you know, such as uh, imagination, creativity, poetry, love, and makes them all commodities. Completely reductionistic, materialistic approach to life. And this is enforced through Pavlovian conditioning. Operant conditioning, as it's called in psychology today, where you have to sit on an uncomfortable wooden chair for hours every day under the control of a system of bells that interrupt your flow every 45 minutes or so and then send you to the next class or whatever. And this goes on and on and on for a minimum of 12 years. And if you should be so unfortunate as to go to college, it continues for another four or six years or whatever. So it's no surprise that when you begin the spiritual path, and the spiritual path is saying things like, your ego is just a construct, it doesn't really exist, it's not real, etc., the ego is going to rebel. I remember going back to my early days on the path, I doubted everything. I searched for a guru. The second question relates to guru. But I searched for a guru for years because I couldn't find anybody that met my standards. I admit my standards are very high. <laughs> but finally, when I was introduced to Srila Prabhupada, I had to say, oh, this person has real intelligence. This person has uh, an insight which is beyond any Western knowledge, indeed any intellectual knowledge whatsoever. Because he's talking about things beyond human sensory perception. Now, this is Vedic knowledge. But we have been conditioned with materialism, and worse than that, reductionism, which says that everything is material, everything is rational, a bunch of atoms colliding with each other and all this stuff, or quantum mechanics or whatever. And they even try to explain consciousness with quantum mechanics, which is like totally dull. And the ego is going to resist. It's going to say, uh-oh, this transcendental knowledge is beyond me. It's more powerful than I am. It comes from a higher intelligence than I have access to. 
It talks about things that can't be verified by direct sense perception. So I'm going to doubt it. And even though, for example, in my case, when I had an introduction to a obviously very powerful realized being, I doubted it. I doubted him. Even though I had absolutely no evidence, uh, still, I resisted the teaching. <laughs> of course, you know, I was in San Francisco in the high hippie days, and I was a musician, you know, which is like the god of the hippie religions. <laughs> and let's just say that whatever I wanted came pretty easily. Uh, so, you know, I was high on the hog there, and uh, I didn't want to give up this lifestyle where I had some glory, I had some prestige, you know. Uh, but, you know, God has a way of chipping away at your resistance. And the reason for that is, that God or spiritual life is really what we want, isn't it? We want an eternal existence without any death. We want to know everything. We want to have power. And most of all, we want to have love. And love is a very scarce commodity in the material world, precisely because of the educational conditioning that we've all been through, which erases just about every possibility of actual love. Because love is based on the awareness that I am a spirit and you're a spirit. And I see the good qualities in me and I see the same good qualities in you. And all the bad qualities are coming from the body and the mind, huh? all these desires that we have for material things, which cause us to do all kinds of weird stuff. So we have to give up the false security of the material philosophy, the material worldview, and surrender to the spiritual worldview, which ultimately leads to Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. But <clears throat> this cannot be accomplished overnight. How many years have we been conditioned? Like I said, at least 12 or 16 years in school and college. And then beyond that, in life itself, because the whole system of life on planet Earth is designed around this concept of material reductionism. So we have to move beyond that view. And that's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take about as long as it took to condition us, to decondition us, or recondition us to a different worldview. But don't be in a hurry. Do the preliminaries. Don't try to skip things like finding a guru and surrendering and doing service and doing religious rituals according to the instructions in the scriptures. Karma yoga. Huh? Because if you follow those instructions and do those rituals, you get help. You get help from within. It awakens something within that goes, oh, yeah, this is right. This is actually the way it is. And that tends to counteract the skeptical, nihilistic ego, saying, oh, this is all nonsense. Uh, you can't prove any of this. La, 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 la. <laughs> Always nattering in the background. Look, I know, I've been there. I've been like that. I've been in that state. And I got beyond it by sheer perseverance. And so, also I had help from my guru and so on. So that's the next question. 
It would seem that the disciple cannot attain self-realization without the grace of the guru. This grace allows the disciple to more easily overcome, appease, dissolve the ego. By this I mean, without the grace of the guru, the ego cannot be fought because it would be too difficult. Yes. <laughs> the ego is firmly entrenched in the mind. So when we come across a teaching that says ultimately there is no ego, it's a total fabrication, uh, it's unreal, then the ego is going to fight back. So you need an ally, you need someone on your side who can overcome the ego for you, someone who has overcome their ego and got beyond it. <clears throat> At least that is encouragement that it can be done. And more than that, he knows how it's done. And we have given this teaching, I don't know, how many innumerable times. You begin with karma yoga, and then you do bhakti. Then out of bhakti, meditation arises naturally. And from meditation, jnana, right? So in the beginning, you're not ready for meditation. Of course, if you try meditation, you're going to fail. Yes, and that is going to continue for quite some time until the heart and mind have been purified sufficiently to remain in meditation. You know, it's just like a cow. When a cow is young, a young calf, you try to train it. But it doesn't want to stay in one place, you know. Cows are grazing animals. They like to move here and there, you know, and the grass is always greener, right? <laughs> so they're restless. But if you take the calf and you tie it to a post, it can only go as far as the length of the rope. And that's it. And in the beginning, it cries and complains and moans and groans. <laughs> bah! because <laughs> that's its nature so in the beginning of spiritual life the ego is being restrained it's saying look ego you're not the god that you make out to be we know now that you're just a sham you're just a pretend being you're not even real huh of course, the ego is going to resist this. So it needs someone to impose discipline. And in the beginning, we're too weak. And we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the experience, the confidence, or any of the things that it takes to actually defeat the ego. So the guru comes and says, <clears throat> you do this, you don't do that. That's yama and niyama. Yama and Niyama are the first two steps in the yoga process. Yama and Niyama, then asana, pranayama, pratyahara, withdrawal of the senses. Huh? And I'm going to do a video specifically on this process because it's the most misunderstood and the least practiced of anything in the yoga system. So that has to happen. All that has to happen before you can even really think about meditation. Because meditation means concentration of the mind. And the nature of the mind is like a jumping monkey, huh? chattering away, all kinds of nonsense. So it has to be trained. It has to be restrained. It has to be disciplined. And the scriptures and the spiritual master provide that discipline. So you have to find a guru. Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti. Aung Namah Shivaya.